M S W Media. The rule of law is not just some lawyer's turn of phrase. It is the very foundation of our democracy. The essence of the rule of law is that like cases are treated alike. That there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, one rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich and another for the poor, or different rules depending upon one's race or ethnicity. To serve as Attorney General at this critical time is a calling I am honored and eager to answer. So yeah, now it's clean up on aisle 45 time. And for a long while yet, it is going to be clean up on aisle 45. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 166 of Clean Up on Aisle 45. It's Wednesday, March 27th, 2024. I'm Allison Gill. And I'm Pete Strzok. we got lots of news today, including a New York appeals court cutting Trump's bond to $175 million, the arrest of Trump lawyer Stephanie Lambert in court, heard that <laughs> right, a Trump golf club settlement that leaves Alina Haba out to dry and an expanded role for the Trump Organization Fiscal Monitor Retired Judge Barbara Jones. Mm, your voice is, is very deep today because I believe you have been sick. Are I have you, been, my, my voice sounds like a pack of cigarettes because I've been <laughs> battling a cold, but I'm on the mend and I anticipate sleeping for more than an hour and a half of cough interrupted sleep tonight. So I'm very excited about that prospect. Good. Well, I'm glad you're feeling better, uh, but we have, yeah, we have uh, base register Pete today. So... <laughs> Um, we're it's also like going to smoky, come... smoky bar, smoky bar, Pete, <laughs> British smoky trolls and cigarettes with, a, with a, shots of whiskey. <laughs> we are, we're also going to cover the hearing uh, about the Manhattan DA's election interference hush money case, which happened on Monday. And, uh, it's now set to begin jury selection on April 15th. We got a ruling there. Uh, we also got rulings on motions in limine in that case this week. And we'll talk about that. A brief update on Fulton County. Uh, a curious influx of cash into Truth Social, and a very bad week for House Republicans. But first, it is Hall of Fame Day uh, for patrons on on Clean Up on All Forty Five, where we thank our Hall of Famers, uh, our biggest donors. And I just got to say here, I know we said that whatever you put as your name, we would read, but we really aren't going to read stuff that either endangers our jobs or our livelihoods or is so vulgar that it's triggering or something that's designed to humiliate either one of us. Um, just an FYI. Uh, but with that, let's thank Catherine Gilbert White is totally awesome at her job. Jeffrey Kincher. I hope I'm saying that right. Star Lanus, the ball tanning salon. And this used to be, I'm a trash bag from Arizona. And Jason B, David Chandler, Maris Lawson, ATX polar bear. Tiffany Trump was adopted. Maria Tovar, Dr. David, thank you so much for all you do. We couldn't do this without you. Thank you for supporting independent media and just being fucking rocks. Excuse me, being rock stars. We 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 usually only swear on the on the bonus episode for patrons, but, but your support is so amazing, so amazing. You I, I could swear on the regular pod. The f bomb. Uh, and with that, let's start in New York, where we just learned that Judge Mershon has set trial for April 15th. Now, you'll remember, Trump's lawyers, one who worked at the Southern District of New York for a really long time, by the way, made a really late request for discovery uh, in January to the SDNY, and they got about 119,000 pages. Then they fired off a motion to dismiss the whole case based on discovery violations and asked for sanctions and accused the DA of discovery misconduct, uh, prosecutorial misconduct. Now, the judge saw right through it at the hearing on Monday. And he wondered why they were even there. Because first of all, fewer than 300 of those documents were even relevant to this case. And none of them were exculpatory, were helpful to Donald Trump. They were inculpatory. They were bad news for him. So withholding those wasn't going to help Donald Trump prove his innocence. <laughs> And uh, but did it, you know, the, the judge was like, nobody withheld anything from you. This is all your fault. 
he determined, the judge determined that the late discovery, all Trump's fault, not the fault of the DA, not the fault of the DOJ. And he was not friendly about it either, according to people who were in the courtroom. And he set the trial date, jury selection, to begin April 15th. Now, I thought maybe he'd go for April 29th so that he wouldn't have to, because Passover is April 22nd and 23rd. But he set it for April 15th for jury selection. So the actual delay here, all of that uh, resulted in about 21 days of delay, which is the only first and only delay for this trial. And I'm not saying there won't be another one. I don't think there will be because, you know, Trump was like, I'm going to file an appeal of this decision. And the judge was like, great, go ahead. Everybody else see you on April 15th <laughs> on his way out of the courtroom. So <laughs> not a good day for Trump there. Yeah. And that's not all. Before the hearing, uh, George Merchon ruled on motions in limine, which are motions that each party files to limit the testimony or evidence that can be used in court. And we went over these motions in a previous episode. And you may recall that Trump wanted to prohibit things like Michael Cohen, Stormy Daniels, and Karen McDougal from testifying. He wanted to ban the phrase catch and kill from the trial. The he violent phrase. The- he said, he said, we need to not use the violent phrase, catch and kill. <laughs> catch and kill. Yeah, Tim, it's so so inflammatory. But uh, he you know, he wanted to eliminate the argument that election interference was the motivation for the hush money scheme, and he wanted to keep the access Hollywood tape out of the proceedings. Well, Judge Murchon ruled on these motions late last week, and here's what he says: First, Michael Cohen, Stormy Daniels, and Karen McDougal can testify. The phrase, the horrible phrase, the violent phrase, catch and kill, will be allowed. <laughs> Prosecutors will be able to argue that the hush money scheme was meant to influence the 2016 election, which, by the way, is the entire prosecution theory of the case. Right. So that's yes, that that is what they're saying. This is not some simple financial fraud. The entire reason for bringing the case is that it was intended to influence the 2016 election. So thank God they're actually going to be able to argue that um, he did, however, note that the Access Hollywood tape is not allowed, but. Prosecutors are allowed to describe it in alleging Trump's motive for the hush money payments. The judge will allow the tape in if the defense opens the door. The judges reserve the decision on whether prosecutors can mention other sexual assault allegations against Trump. Trump will not be able to argue that his prosecution is new or novel. He can't complain about true trial delay. He can't attack the alleged motives of the DA, the judge, or the court staff to the jury. And he can't try to gain sympathy for his potential punishment. Trump wanted to block the admission of over 100 of his own public statements. And that was denied by the judge. And as long as prosecutors establish a foundation at trial. And then finally, prosecutors will not be allowed to introduce Stormy Daniels polygraph results, which I think all in all, you know, that that rundown is pretty favorable to uh to the prosecution, I was reminded, Allison, the, the Marcy Wheeler, uh, empty wheel on Twitter, was pointing out, I, I think, a very good observation today that Trump's entire defense process, he is like the boy that cries wolf at every possible opportunity, including in court. And every single court appearance is Trump complaining the it's not fair. It's not fair. It's not it's right. I'm being maligned. This isn't fair. He is like the person, as I've said before, sitting behind you at the football game, baseball game, whatever it is, complaining that everything is rigged and every call is bad. And I think the point being today, in particular, listening to the reporting coming out of court, that's starting to catch up because it sounded like Judge Murchon was like, look, you know, it, it is... <laughs> you know, these these arguments are nonsense. You have not raised them before. You were at a hearing several months ago after you asked for these documents in January. You didn't mention any of this delay at that subsequent you know, sort of interim hearing. So why is it coming up now? And I, I think it's good, unlike Eileen Cannon, you catch up with occasional judges who know what they're doing and aren't willing to put up with BS. And suddenly they kind of like very incisively cut through some of the BS that the Trump's attorneys are trying to throw up in the way. Yeah. And, and the judge actually kind of talked about how I think it's Todd Blanche who used to work at the Southern District of New York, who's an attorney yeah. for Trump. He's like, you know, you worked there for a really long time. You know, the inner workings of what goes on in the Southern District. And in, in one of these filings that the DA uh, gave to the court, he's like, look, the, the Southern District of New York didn't even have these relevant documents, these 300 documents, uh, when the DA asked for them a year ago, they didn't come in 
to the Southern District of New York until December of of 2023. And that was pursuant to a FOIA request, an intra-agency FOIA request. And so the the judge was kind of like, Todd Blanche, you know how to get documents that haven't been handed over yet from the from this from your former agency. And with a, you know, he didn't directly accuse him of doing this on purpose. I did. <laughs> you know, last week in a, a thing I put up on post and uh, when I talked about it on the Daily Beans, it seemed clear to me that they knew what was going on. They knew that they could subpoena these things in January and that they would get some new documents from the Southern District of New York and they would be able to cry wolf, as you and, and Marcy Wheeler said. They would be able to say, look, we got these new documents. We've never seen them before. Uh, we have to delay the trial and there should be sanctions against the DA for withholding this stuff. And that th- you should dismiss the whole case based on the fact that we got these new documents. And the judge seemed to sort of hint at the fact that that might have been exactly what happened. But the judge was like, this is all Trump's fault. Um, and trial starts April 15th. And and that's the end of the story. He and, you know, like I like I had said before, I know Adam Klausfeld was there. Lisa Rubin was in uh, court and they have told um, Twitter and MSNBC like he was really, really mad. Uh, the judge was really, really mad about this. I know everybody kind of made a big deal about how um, he, you know, he said he was going to set this hearing, the judge, he was going to set this hearing for March 25th, and that he would set a trial date if it's necessary to have a trial, meaning that, you know, he's going to listen and consider Trump's motion to dismiss this case. And everybody was kind of, uh, you know, um, getting uh, worried about that. And, and, and you know, you, you and I talked about this, Pete. It was He has to say that because he, he can't make an indication of how he's going to rule from the bench. So, April April 15th my friend we might you know look at uh maybe going to New York in May and checking out this trial uh but it's it's going forward uh, I'd like to see how long jury selection takes um could take a few days could take a few weeks I don't know I really have no idea this is New York the E. Jean Carroll jury selection didn't take very long but we'll see um and you know we'll keep you posted here yeah, I think it may take a while longer. I mean, that was a civil trial. Um, they were both state cases, not federal cases. But I think when you get to a criminal trial, the jury selection process gets a lot more uh, in depth and, and potentially contentious. So I wouldn't be surprised to see it uh, last a few weeks. But you know, it's interesting because Trump has so you know, as we've talked about before, the huge amount of money that is going to his legal bills. He's got a wide range of competency in his representation. And Todd Blanche is a good attorney. I mean, he was a, a very competent prosecutor. He is a very competent defense attorney, and it's funny when you see, you know, unlike Alina Haba, who is sitting there, in my opinion, way out of her depth in the civil trial for the Trump organization, when it comes to the potential landing his ass in jail, uh, he tends to have decent attorneys. And I think a lot of what we're seeing and, you know, the, the tearing apart of Blanche that we saw today was probably because Blanche was trying to, you know, please his client who's insisting on the whiny you know, this is unprecedented prosecution by Biden and his team and other stuff that he probably ordinarily would not put in the filing, but because Trump demanded it, it was in there. And we saw the the consequences of that today. But, you know, it'll be interesting. I think, you know, I, I do think there is a high likelihood that this will begin on that day. I can see the actual trial itself, not starting until the beginning of May. And then as, as long as the trial takes, uh, you know, it could be a while, it could be three plus weeks, but definitely. We're we're getting there. This is not. I think today's result was very clearly that we are going to have a trial in this case well before uh, the summer, the late summertime. Yeah, and we'll see how it all shakes out. Because if they have like a May June or slash July trial here, or like a June July trial, or you know, I don't think that the documents case is going to go in May uh, in in Florida, but it's it still on the calendar. <laughs> um, and. <laughs> Then we have, and you know, Trump has a history of pitting his trial dates against one another to delay them all. Um, we've got the April 25th immunity hearing at the Supreme Court. They could schedule a trial starting in August. I know Fonnie Willis, we'll talk about this later, wants to try, uh, schedule a late summer trial. They're all sort of coming together. Uh, everybody's trying to go before the election, except for Eileen Cannon. So <laughs> we'll see what ends up happening. But all of these different trials could push other trials. And I'm also concerned about whether or not Fonnie Willis would be willing to sort of 
cede her trial in favor of the January 6th federal trial. But, well, yeah, that's that's a little bit down the road and we'll talk about it as it happens. All right. We have more news from New York, including the Trump bond being lowered to $175 million. We'll talk about that, but we have to take a quick break. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. More Hall of Fame patrons to thank, including BackdropBooks.com, Chris Simpson, Clover's Tree 73, Karen Sherman, Mr. Halfspeed, Scott Griegs, Suzanne Ashworth, Sharon Tikalski, at Dirt Road Dems, Lance Buckley, and Mitchell. Thank all of you so much for your support. Um, you truly are the heroes of this program, uh, critical partners, and thank you so much for your ongoing support and allowing us to, to put this together for you every week. So with that said, let's stay in New York. Um, and today, a New York appellate court granted Trump's stay, giving him 10 more days to post bond in the $454 million New York Attorney General civil fraud disgorgement judgment. And importantly, the appeals court decreased the bond amount to $175 million. Now, here's how the order reads. It is ordered that the motion is granted to the extent of staying enforcement of those portions of the judgment, one, ordering disgorgement to the Attorney General of $464,576,230.62, conditioned on defendants' appellants posting within 10 days of the date of this order, an undertaking in the amount of $175 million. Two, permanently barring defendants Weisselberg and McConney from serving in the financial control function of any New York corporation or similar business entity. Three, barring defendants Donald J. Trump, Weisselberg, and McConney from serving as an officer or director of any New York corporation for three years. Four, barring defendant Donald J. Trump and the corporate defendants from applying for loans from New York financial institutions for three years. And five, barring defendants Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump from serving as an officer or director of any New York corporation in New York for two years. The aforesaid stay is conditioned on defendants' appellants perfecting the appeals for the September 2024 term of this court. The motion is otherwise denied, including to the extent it seeks a stay of enforcement portions of the judgment, one, extending and enhancing the role of the monitor, and two, directing the installment of an independent director of compliance. Now, all that's, you know, interesting. So first is, you know, Trump has said, look, I'm going to post the $175 million bond in cash. And we'll see if he says, you know, if he has it, he's been going back and forth between saying he doesn't have it. And he had to scratch up, you know, a bond for uh, E. Jean Carroll's $91 million. And so for him to turn around and say, yeah, I got 175, no problem. But look, he's got 10 days um, from Monday. So the new deadline is April 4th. Now, the appeals court didn't give any reason for its math or exactly why it lowered the bond, but there were some interesting you know, some interesting commentary out there that, look, this may not be a bad thing because on the one right. hand, if they hadn't have done this, right, there, there was the possibility that New York would have to go out and find that $464 million, whether it's by seizing accounts, by trying to get equity out of property, that would be the, have the potential of being a very long, cumbersome, and perhaps, you know, largely fruitless process, right? And expensive. Now, with this, yeah, if he posts the $175 million bond in cash, they know they've got that 175 period. That That's right there. That bond is available to the state of New York. It, Yeah, you know, it's less than half, and that's frustrating, but it's certainly, you know, $175 million in hand versus trying to scratch up placing liens on all kinds of things to try and litigate through and get to 464 you know, when you've got you go and well, you put a lien on Trump Tower, but it's got other liens on there. It it sounds bad. But at the end of the day, I, I don't know that New York is necessarily unhappy about this result. Yeah. And and Tis James put out a statement that sort of said that, um, you know, here, here we are. He's still liable for the four hundred fifty four million dollars and this will continue. Um, and also, you know, it is it is noteworthy that basically everything now is stayed. The losing the licenses, being barred from borrowing from New York certified banks, being barred from running your uh, companies, all that is stayed right now. The only thing that is not is retired Judge Barbara Jones hmm. and the uh, the other um, the I I would say an I I D C uh, the installation of an independent director of compliance, right? 
Right. And that's important because just, just this past week, Judge Engoron expanded the role of the fiscal monitor, Barbara Jones. And that's significant in that Trump will now have to inform. And a lot of this is the same, but there's they've, they've added stuff, including stuff about getting a bond, which now he has to get one for $175 million. And like you said, he had a hard time getting $91 million for e Jean. He put up a Schwab account, right, in its entirety to back that. And he says he has the cash. Um, but now Trump has to give Barbara Jones all the bank statements monthly within five days of the end of the month. He has to get permission to move more than $5 million out of any of his accounts. And he has to get permission before anyone else can give him $5 million or more. Uh, he has to tell her if uh, he restructures any debt or equity. He has to tell her if any of his debts are paid by anyone, including loans to himself. Remember that $48 million <laughs> loan <laughs> that nobody could figure out if it was paid or not that he made to himself? So if any of his debts are paid, he has to notify Barbara Jones. And he has to inform her in advance of any efforts to secure a surety bond. Any financial disclosures he has to make to secure that bond, like how he secures it, and any representations he makes to bond companies to get the bond. Also, any obligations that Trump or the Trump organization is required to to comply with in order to get the bond, like what his you know, his obligations are when he gets a bond. All of that and Barbara Jones will report all of it to the court on a quarterly basis or whenever she sees fit. So if Russia wants to dump 80, you know, $175 million into one of his accounts, Trump has to notify her and she will probably notify the court. <laughs> so uh, also she's allowed to hire any third parties to help her with any of this and Trump has to pay for it. So that is the expansion uh, in part of, of Barbara Jones. And, and she is also uh, has, uh, I think, 30 days to, again, recommend somebody as the independent director of compliance that will also be installed. So a lot going on in New York, a lot going on in that case. I tend to think $175 million in the hand is worth none in, you know, is better than none. Um, and that if he can make it right. And we'll, we'll know in, in 10 days, whether or not he can, um, he may have some cash coming to him in some stock holding options in true social. We'll talk about that later, but that would take a long time. Uh, and he, again, he has to tell Barbara Jones how he's securing these bonds, what his obligations are, what his collateral is. And she will be reporting that on a quarterly basis. So it's, really still pretty humiliating for him, but I think puts him in a better spot than he was in Friday. <laughs> yeah. And keep in mind two things, right? The first thing is the $464 million is still there. That yeah. is still the judgment that has not been reduced in any way that is still out there. It is just instead of having to put down and actually remember it's 370 some odd million with 90 in interest, that amount still sits out there. The only thing this changes is is that instead of having to put all of that down, he's having to put down just the 175. So it's not as if the court reduced it, right? That there isn't this additional, if this is upheld, that there's not an additional 200 and whatever that is, $280,000 still that he will have to pay. And then the second point is, this is disgorgement, right? This is not like, hey, you did bad, and so I'm fining you. This is you made all these ill-gotten gains. Think of it, you went and you robbed the bank and you have all this money at your house and you have to give it back. It is not I'm fining you this $464 million. It is you made this $464 million, which includes interest, illicitly. So give it back. And so I've heard some people saying, oh, it's a fine. It's not a fine. Right. He is giving back the things he got illegally, right? The benefit that he got through these advantageous loan rates and everything else. So, you know, I, I, I get a little aggravated sometimes when people talk about a fine. It's not a fine. It's disgorgement. Right. And that's important to remember. These are all these these are recouping bad things he did in the past that he has to his advantage. It reminds me of Manafort's asset forfeiture, right? All of his ill gotten gains through money laundering, he had to ha the the government seized those. That's federal, obviously. Um, but that's kind of what I think of in my head when I think of what disgorgement is. You got a loan fraudulently to buy this property. What that property value is, that loan value is, we're taking it back because you got it by breaking the law. 
it would be like if I lied on a mortgage application uh, to get a mortgage that I couldn't afford. And, you know, by virtue of me lying on that application, broke the law, defrauded the bank, they get that money back or the house. You know, as it's, it's it's not mine. I st- I stole it by lying. So it's, that's kind of how it, you know, how how this whole thing breaks down. That's a really good point. And yeah, so ten days we'll know by April fourth whether or not he can come up with this bond. Again, he had a real hard time coming up with the E. Jean Carroll bond, uh, but maybe he has it. Like he said, he told everybody today, "I have it. I have half a million dollars, half a billion dollars in cash. I was going to spend it on my campaign, but Joe Biden." Uh, is making me give it over. You know, it's just absolute ridiculous lies and falsehoods that he's just spewing. And every time they, the the MSNBC went to show his comments that after like a minute, they just went back to studio. Okay, he's all right. He's talking. He's telling his lies again. We'll let you know if he says anything different this time. Um, and fact checked, fact checked him right away. So we will uh, keep you posted. All right, we've got a lot more news to get to, but we do have to take another quick break. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We have more Hall of Fame patrons to thank. Thank you so much. Big giant thanks and digital hugs and virtual hugs going out to Fran Reichenbach, Pinky, Charles Jones, F the Chiefs, but I do love Tay Tay, Kirkland J. Bateman, Patty B, Christine Tackner. All podcast hosts are smoke shows. Change my mind. Thank you. David in Brooklyn and Nathan Dorn. Um, oh, also, One sorry. More. Boy, would I like to be the bus driver. Very good. We're going to need a bigger bus. Okay. We learned this week about a fun little quid pro quo between a billionaire TikTok investor and Donald Trump. To recap, Trump used to be vehemently against TikTok. He wanted it banned in the United States. He even tried to do it via executive order, was sued and overturned. He moved to ban it in the U.S. when he was president, but recently changed his tune. Complete 180. And now he opposes the legislation that would force the sale of TikTok from its Chinese owner, ByteDance. The bill has passed the House, but it faces some steep opposition in the Senate. Biden has said he would sign the bill if it gets to his desk, and it would give ByteDance six months to sell TikTok or face having the app banned here in the U.S. That about face by Trump came after a meeting with a billionaire investor in TikTok named Jeff Yass. And we just learned he's also the biggest institutional shareholder of the shell company that recently merged with Trump's truth social media company. The former president's Trump media shares could provide him with a financial lifeline to raise the cash needed to get a bond. But to do that, he needs Trump media's seven member board to remove a restriction that prevents him from selling shares or using the shares as collateral from a, for a bond. So the board would have to vote. Oh, but they'll never do that, right, Allison? No, They'd never of do that, right? Let's let's see who's on the board. Um, okay, oh, okay, okay. Who's on the board? Uh, Don Jr. Okay, uh. Uh, three former members of the Trump administration: Kosh Patel, uh. Uh. Robert Ligthizer, who's the U.S. Trade Representative, former U.S. Trade Representative, and Linda McMahon. Uh, she's former administrator of the Small Business Administration and currently uh, the chair of a huge Trump fundraiser in April. Oh, so <laughs> well, when you put it that way, <laughs> so hmm. do you think the board will vote for Trump to be able to use <laughs> these shares as collateral for a bond? Yeah, is is uh, Nunez on there too? I think Devin Nunez might be on there too. One, two, three. Uh, he four, might five, have quit. I, I do, can't uh, remember. It's like, it's like the Politburo. There's no way they're going to vote against whatever Daddy Trump says do. So. Yeah, I don't know, though, because a few days ago you texted me a report outlining the risks associated with investing in Trump's social media company. What did you what did you find? I, Pete? I did. And as a backdrop, I've just got to plug the the Leviathan, the the huge U.S. financial market and what they represent in the global economy, specifically p- because of the transparency uh, that exists in a way that doesn't exist anywhere else around the world. I mean, some markets in Western Europe uh, are close, but when you get to like China or Russian markets, there's nowhere near the transparency. And of course, this came out because Black Tuesday in 1929, when our markets just utterly crashed, that was followed up by legislation in 1993 and 1994. 
1933 and 1934, the Securities Exchange Acts of both those years, which essentially lay out that, hey, if you are going to trade stock, if you're going to issue stock, newly issued securities through an IPO, you have to disclose all these things. And then a year later, 1934, saying, look, as you trade, as things are going on, you have to be uh, very transparent in disclosures so that investors can understand what is behind the stock that you're offering. And oh, so, so it's this... kind of like when I sell a house, I have to disclose everything that's wrong with the house before I sell it. Exactly. And so in, in the US, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, uh, regulates this and has all the you know mandates, all the reporting requirements. And in this case, Digital World Acquisition Corp, or DWAC, which is the SPAC, the, the vehicle that was registering with uh, Trump Media, submitted back in February um, this long, 100, <laughs> you can go look it up online. Um, it's a very long, you know, 150, maybe more, 200 pages of disclosures. But what's interesting is they go through and you have to list out all your risks. Like, what is a risk to an investor? And they lay it out. And keep in mind, this, these are Trump's people, right? These are the folks who are trying to get this merger through. These are the people who are trying to launch, which uh, TMTG, Trump Media something group, I forget what the names are. But keep in mind, these are written, what I'm about to read you, are written by the people trying to get Trump's stock on the market. So it says, in this is page 132, if you go to it, a number of companies, this is a big overall risk, a number of companies that were associated with President Trump have filed for bankruptcy. There can be no assurances that TMTG will not also become bankrupt. It goes on to further explain, entities associated with President Trump have filed for bankruptcy protection. The Trump Taj Mahal, which was built and owned by President Trump, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 1991. The Trump Plaza, the Trump Castle, and the Plaza Hotel, all owned by President Trump at that time, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 1992. THCR, which was founded by President Trump in 1995, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 2004. Trump Entertainment Resorts, Inc., the new name given to Trump Hotels and Casino Reports Resorts after its 2004 bankruptcy, declared bankruptcy in 2009. While all of the foregoing were in different businesses than TMTG, there can be no guarantee that TMTG's performance will exceed the performance of those entities. Next risk factor, a number of companies that had license agreements with President Trump have failed. There can be no assurances that TMTG will not also fail. Explaining, Trump Shuttle, Inc., launched by President Trump in 1989, defaulted on its loans in 1990 and ceased to exist by 1992. Trump University, founded by President Trump in 2005, ceased operations in 2011 amidst lawsuits and investigations regarding that company's business practices. Trump Vodka. A brand of vodka produced by Drinks <laughs> Americas under the license from the Trump Organization was introduced in 2005 and discontinued in 2011. Trump Mortgage LLC, a financial services company founded by President Trump in 2006, ceased operations in 2007. GoTrump.com, a travel site founded by President Trump in 2006, ceased operations in 2007. Trump Steaks, a brand of steak and other meats, other meats. <laughs> Other meats, Allison. <laughs> Founded by President Trump in 2007, discontinued sales two months after its launch. While all of these businesses were in different industries than TMTG, there can be no guarantee that TMTG's performance will exceed the performance of these entities. I swear to you, Allison, I swear the Biden campaign should just take these Trump SEC filings and just plaster them in fund mail e emails uh, to, you know, doing fundraising. There is no reason, there's absolutely no reason that any investor, when you look at the revenues that are coming into Trump social, should invest a penny in the now about to be openly traded to the public on NASDAQ, I think, tomorrow under DJT, ticker, ticker stock number. And for those of you who are into the stock market, those of you who are into speculative, I'm not offering, I'm not a licensed investment advisor. I do not have any information about this. It just seems to me, given Trump's past performance, DJ ticker, DJT on NASDAQ would be an amazing short sell opportunity. Now, again, non investment advice, but any moron and given the people who are buying Trump bucks and all these other goddamn NFTs and everything else, I'm certain people will line up to own a part of the Trump media empire for the low price of $30 or whatever the stock you know launches at. It's not a good investment. This is not going to last. The governing board is made up of crooks and shysters, in my opinion, 
and is ill suited to have any sort of financial success, let alone success meriting Mr. Yass's. How much? How much did he put into this? I mean, we're talking millions and millions and millions of dollars. Two percent, yeah, millions. And Yass is no dummy. It is clear, again, in my opinion. That Yass is bankrolling Trump, who is in desperate need of cash right now, to get Trump to turn around the end goal, to stop saying mean things about TikTok, to say just let TikTok be, because Yass has such huge exposure in his the parent company ByteDance, I think, holdings. 60%. Right. I mean, that's a ton of money. And this is just a transparent, here's a ton of money. I know you're short from money right now. Do me a favor. Stop saying mean things about TikTok. What does Donald Trump start doing immediately? Mm -hmm. Stop saying mean things about TikTok. The entire Chinese communist controlling TikTok and ByteDance, and it's a threat to our youth, and we're not going to let the Chicoms do it? Mm? Not if Jeff Yass gives enough money to Donald Trump. Right. So we'll see. Just we will. So corrupt. We will. And um, it, it's, it's insanely corrupt. And I don't know if there's anything illegal specifically about that kind of a quid pro quo, but that kind of a business deal. But if they're short selling or pump and dumping, pumping and dumping, uh, yeah, absolutely. And and you know that the SEC is looking at this. They've already indicted four people involved with the with the SPAC, the DWAC merger, the SPAC merger. So, <laughs> and there could be more to come. So this is under a huge microscope. Um, but uh, and you know this. But personally, I don't think that this legislation is the answer. Uh, I'm not really for this legislation either, but for very different reasons. Um, I think all this needs to be fixed at the core. It feels like this is a Band-Aid um, uh, situation. Like, so it goes from ByteDance to Steve Mnuchin. Like, are we any better off? He's he's bankrolled by PRC, I'm sure. So like, I, it, it and we've got other social media companies that are owned in large part by uh, foreign interests as well. Uh, it just it seems like we need to have across the board um, better laws that, that catch up with the technology, in my opinion. But nonetheless, uh, TikTok guy heavily invested into yeah. uh, Donald Trump and his uh, truth social platform. And I, I love also that a lot of the risks are uh, people hate Trump and Trump sucks and his popularity could decline severely even more as he faces all these criminal trials. Um, and so that's a risk. Trump sucks is a risk. Um, that, yeah. It's all and, over there. It's all over. And, it's all in the SEC or, you know, in the filing to the SEC about the risks associated with investing in True Social. And, and listen, we have the most amazing set of listeners. And if any of you had the opportunity to sample Trump steaks, particularly the other meats, I, I would, would love to hear from you because that just, uh, it, it, has stoked my curiosity. And I do remember that I think there's a Saturday Night Live skit um, a while back, like whenever that was around the same time. But I wonder I, if he just, could get a contract to supply other meats to the Miami Correctional Facility. Other meats, other meats for Peter Navarro, other for meats Pe in small <laughs> tins for $1.99, limit two a week. Commissary meats. <laughs> Commissary meats. That's That's better. For the January six hostages, commissary meets <laughs> Trump commissary meets and gold uh, foil. God. God, all right. Well, thank you for that. That's fascinating, and and I'll I'll make sure to send that to the White House. I'll be like, look, here's this is gold uh, for your campaign. Also, uh, before we take a break, we have a brief update in in Fulton County. Uh, we'll last up to date. We you know as up to date as we were was that uh, Wade resigned, Willis accepted. Uh, and the, the, you know, the whole trial is moving forward. But according to people familiar with her thinking, D.A. Willis wants to ask the court for a summer trial. I was talking about this earlier in the show. She said, I only need 30 days to get ready to go. And I think she told a reporter that the train is coming or something like that. It's not stopping. Um, I would prefer if the prosecutors maybe didn't go out on the news. I know Wade uh, Wade was going to go on Meet the press. We talked about this last week and then canceled last minute. I think that that was a wise decision. And not because I don't think prosecutors should be able to to speak. But um, I know that, and not, not that I agree with this necessarily, but I know Judge McAfee was concerned about her extrajudicial comments before. And so that's all. That's all I'm saying. Um, not that I think it's right that he should be or anything like that. I'm not opining on anything like that. I'm just going by what the what the judge is saying here. But 
She said the trains are coming and nothing's stopping it. And also, uh, we learned Monday, this just a couple of days ago, that Judge McAfee has set a hearing for March 28th, which is next Thursday, uh, or this Thursday, I should say, tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern on certain motions filed by Donald Trump and David Schaefer, David Schaefer, uh, head of the GOP down there in Georgia. And you'll be able to watch that tomorrow at 10 Eastern on uh, Judge McAfee's YouTube channel if you if they aren't airing it on the news, which they have been pretty consistently airing all of the proceedings, at least on MSNBC. I haven't flipped over to CNN since the Trump town hall, but <laughs> it looks like uh, we'll be able to catch that hearing as well because all of the all of the Fulton County stuff is televised. So that's where we are. Um, Fonnie Willis says she is ready to go. And um, she doesn't believe that this um, disqualification uh, hearing and evidentiary hearings have delayed the case at all. And so she is prepared to ask for a summer trial. She wants to go before the election, too. I don't know if that's. I don't know. I know that there's another case that she's trying. Um, out of the DA's office at that the God, the jury selection took like eight months or something, something massive. Um, and so it could be a very, very lengthy jury selection. We'll see. We'll see what she puts in as a date and we'll see if um, Judge McAfee accepts it. There's still outstanding appeals up to the Supreme Court, like uh, concerning Meadows and wanting to remove to federal uh, jurisdiction instead of state court. Um, I don't think he'll win that, but that's still up in the air. There still seems to be a lot of things up in the air. I don't think that the judge allowed her for a cutoff date for, um, you know, deciding to cooperate or take a plea deal. He said, you can kind of have that sort of unofficially in the background, but I'm not going to put an official cutoff date for when people can no longer plead. Um, And we haven't seen anybody else plead. So Uh, We'll see um, when that motion comes out. We'll cover it here and we'll cover, obviously, what McAfee says. But you can tune into that hearing tomorrow about some of these motions that Trump and Schaefer are filing. All right. We still have a few stories left. I mean, And we aren't we don't even cover Pete, the Jack Smith, the federal investigations. So I don't know how people jam all this into individual podcasts, but we still have more news. We have to take a quick break. So everybody stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. Our last batch of Hall of Fame patrons includes Devon went down to Georgia. He was looking for an election to steal. He was in a bind. He was way behind by 11,780 votes. January 20, baby. Please don't read this on the pod. We don't need a call out. Thanks for what you do. Christine G. Passion, a dinosaur in dental school. Roberta Reed, Cindy McNary, Lisa Rollison, Greg Kreimer, and Nacho Supreme Court. Or Nacho Court Bound Grande. Either way, I have indigestion. So <laughs> thank you all so much um, for your support. Thank you for your continuing patronage uh, and allowing us to get out there and bring you this news, uh, both with a lot of detail that you won't get in any one place that I've seen uh, elsewhere online or let alone in the broadcast media. So thank all of you so much for, and for what you do. We and we don't hire Ronna McDaniel. That's true. We we probably I would guess Ron McDaniel would not I don't know that we have sufficient money to give her the reported <laughs> three hundred thousand dollars that NBC decided to pay. But not a penny of your pay. not a penny of your pledge goes to Ron McDaniel. And then, then, yes, <laughs> not a cent to Ronna, insurrectionist enabler, material fact witness in Georgia, if not Michigan and elsewhere, as well as probable grand federal grand jury witness. Uh, testifier but that's all right bring her on board because we need both sides nbc well done Mm -hmm. anyway sorry Mm -hmm. for the rant anyway we have a few more stories to get to first one tickles me every time we get to talk about alina haba because there's this from the daily beast that donald trump's golf club in bedminster new jersey paid eighty two thousand five hundred dollars last week to settle a lawsuit alleging that it had silenced a sexually harassed waitress by tricking her into an unfair hush money deal, according to the ex-employee's lawyer. Funny, funny, they're like, payment for hush money, for sexual matters. There's almost almost a trend that I'm (laughs) sensing in Trump world. But what was interesting, though, is the curiously worded contract left the former president's own attorney, Alina Haba, wide open to getting sued herself. 
Now, this is where Haba gets involved and where it's interesting. Haba had already settled the discrimination lawsuit by her former legal secretary, completely different matter, now faces the wrath of Alice Bianco, who was once a waitress at the Trump National Golf Club Bedminster. Haba pretended to be an ally to Bianco, who wanted to file a sexual harassment claim, but then Haba tricked her into signing an NDA. Bianco is now preparing to sue the club all over again, this time for sexual harassment. But she's also targeting America's favorite parking lot attorney, Alina Haba, with a potential fraud lawsuit as well. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's pretty interesting the whole the way that that whole thing went down because in the settlement for eighty two thousand, the original thing that Haba had her sign gave her fifteen grand and told her she could never talk about it. And so that was ripped up. The NDA was ripped up. They gave her $82,500. And in the the settlement agreement says this does not include Elena Haba. So she, like, they specifically named her and excluded her. So she is now uh, probably going to be on the hook for this. Um, she's already on the hook for a million dollars in sanctions from Judge Middlebrooks in the Southern District of Florida uh, for her, uh, her and Donald Trump's uh, frivolous lawsuit against uh, Hillary Clinton at all. Do you know anybody that was in that at all? Mm, yeah, but, yeah and, and it's still, and they're appealing. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, it was personally it served by, or attempted to be served by the hapless process server who uh, yeah, couldn't get the job done. But uh, that was, it's under appeal right now. They were found like nearly a million dollars in sanctions, like you said, and, and now they've appealed that decision to the Circuit Court of Appeals. And I'm curious to see, I'm, that will eventually, I'm sure, play out. But uh, it's still like everything Donald Trump does, just keep litigating it until it goes away. Yep. Yep, for sure. Uh, next up, Trump lawyer Stephanie Lambert has been arrested. OK, this is fun. So <laughs> Stephanie Lambert was indicted by Dana Nessel's special prosecutor in Michigan for her role in the fraudulent elector scheme in Michigan. And she didn't show up to a preliminary hearing in Michigan. And so the judge issued a bench warrant for his arrest. Six days later, she filed a notice to appear for one Patrick Byrne, who is the, uh, you know, former Overstock CEO and uh, Maria Butina honeypot target <laughs> from the 2016 election. And he was also hanging out with this crack and strike force at the plantation, making plans to to have a coup. And. So he is suing Dominion voting machines, or they're suing him. But it's a defamation case. I, I I can't remember who's suing who in that particular case. But Stephanie Lambert decided to um, represent Patrick Byrne in that case. And there was a, an appearance in court in D.C. in that case. She went in and she didn't come out. It was uh, it was Hotel California, right? Because she went in, the, the U.S. Marshals then went in, and she didn't. Uh, they didn't see her coming out, so they must have snuck her out in some tunnels uh, and arrested her. And she did eventually turn herself in in Michigan, um, where the bench warrant was out for her arrest. So that's fun to me. Good yeah, times, right? Very much. And you know, and if you look at her booking photo, she's got very much the the Jenna Ellis uh, Trivian Cootie like crazy smiley do you really understand what you're in right now um look about her but uh again props to michigan leading the way badass attorney general dana nessel bringing all these knuckleheads to justice and you know, other states are doing it too but uh, michigan's been out in front and you know stephanie lambert i hope she indicts rana I would love to, that, that would be some sort of poetic justice of like, okay, you know, as you, NBC and whoever the parent company is, is I don't think it's Viacom, but whoever the- Comcast, because she was on the phone call to the Michigan certifiers and yes, said, she was. hey, just sign it. We'll get you a lawyer. Don't worry about it or whatever, you know? Yeah. And, and the aggravating thing was I, I, don't I had to listen to her on Meet the Press on uh, Sunday and I have to give props to Chuck Todd. I know people have a lot of very opinions about Chuck Todd, who is still with NBC as like a senior political commentator, used to be on Meet the Press, but isn't any longer. But after her interview, Chuck Todd essentially said, 
you know, this is horrible. Don't know why we hired her. She undermines the credibility of the organization in general and, you know, kind of spoke his mind. So a lot of props to him. But what was interesting during that interview that she done to meet the press around and I said, oh, I was just trying to reassure these Michigan officials. They were scared. They were being threatened. Well, Rana, if that's the case. Why, what did you say to them? Did you say, don't worry, we won't get the police to give you security. We won't get you private security. No, 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 no. You didn't say that. You said, we'll get you attorneys. <laughs> Getting attorneys has nothing to do with your professed concern about their physical security and the threats that you're getting. So she was a liar then. In my opinion, she's a liar now. She has no business being on NBC News. She's absolutely undermining whatever credibility they had as a news organization. MSNBC has already said... MSNBC commentators, you're under no obligation to ever book her. Uh, and which is interesting because, you know, MSNBC tends to have like the opinion side of the news where NBC is just, you know, think Lester Holt and people are just giving you the straight news. And now in the weird position where MSNBC leadership is willing to say, no, we don't, you don't have to bring her on. But like the objective news portion is like, well, you know, gonna, you know, show up there. I don't know. But, you know, well, they're my- they would save themselves. A lot of pain and a lot of ad revenue. Uh, uh, Canceling, buying out her contract for $300,000 and firing her is going to be way cheaper than I think keeping her on. Uh, And I think they might want to know that, NBC, if you're listening. Uh, Anyway, we've got... um, We've got other interesting news to get to besides Rana. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and this is uh, Salil Kapoor at NBC. Speaking of NBC, Friday began with House conservatives holding a press conference to trash the $1.2 trillion spending bill. Their, negoti- their leaders, Republican House conservatives, their leaders negotiated with the Democrats, sparking some fears about its prospects. Now, it did manage to squeak through, requiring 67% of the House. It ended up winning 68%. But a majority of Republicans voted against it. It was just the first headache of the day for House Republicans as they adjourned. We're in the middle of right now a two week recess, offering a distillation of the infighting and disenchantment that continues to plague the party 15 months into its narrow majority. Things were about to get worse. Moments later, far right Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, Georgia, shocked her colleagues by filing a motion to overthrow Speaker Mike Johnson from Louisiana blasting his stewardship of the chamber and threatening renewed turmoil at the helm of her party. The spending bill was the last vote for Ken Buck, who left early, leaving his seat open for a special election in the 4th District of Colorado. If Lauren Boebert wants to run in the special election to fill Buck's seat, she'll have to leave her vacant seat in the 3rd District, and she's currently in last place in the 4th District. Now, if she runs and loses, she's out, period, out of Congress. On his way out the door, Ken Buck signed two discharge petitions that could force votes on aid for Ukraine and other U.S. allies. <laughs> now, it's not all. In the afternoon, Rep- Representative Mike Gallagher from Wisconsin, the rising star who recently said he'll retire from Congress, announced he'll be quitting early, too, on April 19th. That will be too late to hold a special election to fill his seat, so it would remain vacant until the next term. Within moments of Gallagher's move, though, House Appropriations Chair Kate Granger of Texas made the unusual decision to step down early from her powerful post. And meanwhile, never one to miss a moment, the expelled former Congressman George Santos announced his plans to run as an independent in New York's competitive first district on Long Island, which is currently held by Republican Representative Nick LaLotta. So a lot of just the, the every time you think the drama and the Republican House of Representatives could not get more circus-like, somehow they managed to just sink lower. And, they sure you know, did. There's some, there's some people saying, like, no, throw Gallagher out now. Don't let him wait until the 19th. Force him out. Remove him. Expel him so that, you know, th- there will be a special election. And I would not be surprised when Congress returns. I don't know that this, you know, remove uh, Johnson uh, will go anywhere, but I can see some pressure to get Gallagher out earlier than April 19th. You would need the Democrats votes. You need two thirds to expel. It's not going to happen. They <laughs> they want they want him to wait till the 19th uh, when it's too late to fill his vacant seat. And now if George Santos runs as an independent, he's going to siphon votes off Lalota or Lalada, however you pronounce that, and s- screw the Republicans in New York. So, I mean, I was I've always been certain we would take the House back. 
um, this year, uh, but we might get it back before the election because Ken Buck said, yeah, I know a lot of Republicans are mad at me, but they'll be even more mad at the next three people who resign. And then, bam, Gallagher's gone. Uh, who Who's next, man? You, I, you know, I've said on the beans, maybe Tom McClintock. Uh, they, they could just be doing double barrel middle fingers on the way out of the out of the house. Yeah. And it's funny because somebody asked Ken Buck when he was announced he was leaving. They say, aren't you worried that they're going to be mad at me? And he's like, essentially, no, I'm I'm kind of what they ought to be thinking about is the next two or three people that leave. And so, you know, sure enough, we've had Gallagher go and that leaves him when he's gone. That's a one vote. One it's vote, a one vote majority. And if somebody else leaves. And that's one vote if everyone's there, Pete. That's right. Yeah. Right. And and of course, Scalise is like, I ain't scared. Five votes, one vote doesn't make a difference. OK, buddy, wait, you just wait. I mean, they haven't gotten anything done anyway, um, but it'll be interesting to see if anybody else takes off. Um, and also, finally, if you said it just when you think it couldn't get worse, like there's no rock bottom for the GOP, right? Um, the <laughs> We had that embarrassing hearing with the oversight committee last week. Um, and the Republican witness, Jason Galanis, appeared via Zoom from prison, right? Um, we had Bobolinsky testifying to a bunch of BS, frankly, and Lev Parnas testified for the Democrats. And he, you know, he kind of confirmed stuff we have long known, you know, that Rudy got Bill Barr to let Dmitry Firtash off the hook, who was funding the whole Biden laptop op and the whole shadow diplomacy. We ca I call you know the three amigos they called themselves. Um, I called them the Ukraine clown posse, uh, <laughs> but you know they were over there trying to get dirt on on uh, the Bidens uh, for tw for ahead of the twenty twenty election. They were there in twenty eighteen and twenty nineteen. Hung out with Viktor Shokin. Hung out with Durkach. Hung out with known Russian assets. And um, we're laundering that information into Congress through people like Ron Johnson and Lindsey Graham and Pete Sessions. And it was a very embarrassing hearing uh, for the Republicans. I remember Swalwell called the time of death of the impeachment inquiry at 516 p.m. Eastern time on that day, wrote it on a board. And then um, Moskowitz, Jared Moskowitz, called Jim Jordan and Jim Comer's bluff and said, you want it? You got it enough to impeach him right now? You, you're saying you got the evidence? Do it. I move to impeach the president. Let's have an impeachment vote right now. And he 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 made a motion, and a Republican seconded it, and and then they tabled it. They voted to table table that motion because they don't have the votes. <laughs> and if they did have the evidence, they would have the votes. They've been doing it for 15 months, and uh, it was like you got nothing. It was just, again, just up and down, embarrassing for the Republican Party, and they know it, and they can't do anything about it, because just like Trump called Zelensky and said, just investigate Joe Biden, or I'm, I'm not going to give you the support you need, Trump called Comer and, and Jordan and said, investigate Joe Biden and the Bidens, or I'm not going to, I'm going to, basically what he threatened Pence with on January 6th, I will kill your, your political career. I, that happened, it had to have happened. Uh, and of course, Comer and uh, Jordan are too scared to come out and say that they're being blackmailed by Donald Trump. Yeah. And if you want to know the pecking order on the Republican side of things, there's an amazing photo when Moskowitz does that. And they are, while he's talking, they have a an angle of the camera where it's showing the leadership of the committee. And Comer's sitting in the middle. Jamie Raskin is to Comer's right. Jim Jordan is to his left. Now, people have been zooming in on looking at Raskin and Comer, because Raskin has this huge grin on his face as uh, Moskowitz is talking, and Comer just looks like the most miserable person, like somebody just ran over his dog and, you know, threw him out of the house. But if you pan out that same photo, like Jim Jordan is also laughing at Comer. <laughs> and so if you <laughs> want to know, it's like how poor, paste-eating, simple Gomer, you know, Comer pile, th there is truly... It was that bad. And it was, you know, again, I'd encourage you if you haven't seen it, go. I mean, it's all over Twitter and you can find it. Go to uh, Moskowitz and find the extended clip. I mean, it's about a three minute 
uh, you know, they get five minutes every in their turn. Uh, but there's about a three minute sequence where he is just masterful uh, in terms of talking. And, you know, he'll go back and, you know, Bobolinsky's just sitting there. And, you know, so is that a question? He's like, no, 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 stop. I, I didn't ask you anything. I just like looking at you. And I've just it's a it's a well done um, few minutes by Moskowitz. It was great. It was. Uh, it, it, it It's sad, you know, sad for the house. Um, but that was a great moment. And um, everybody definitely take a look at it. It's pretty easy to find. That's our show. Uh, maybe maybe by next week, we'll, uh, Hakeem Jeffries will have the gavel. Who knows? Who knows what's going to happen uh, over the next week? We can never really quite predict it. Um, it's always unpredictable, um, surprising, but not shocking. And uh, we will cover it for you on the next one. Again, thank you to all of our Hall of Fame patrons. This was your episode. We really, really appreciate everything that you do. I know we're going to see a lot of you on April 20th in D.C. at our MSW Media Gala. And um, I I can't thank you enough. Um, Really, really uh, could not do this without you. Uh, We have, you know, so many bills to pay and, and you really, really help us out. So thanks for supporting independent media. Do you have any final thoughts, Pete? No, thank. Just to echo your thanks. I mean, it's amazing your support, and it's humbling, and uh, truly, it it makes you know getting out and doing this uh, worthwhile and possible. So, thank all of you so much. I am going to go research for the bonus episode whatever I can find about Trump stakes and all the other franchise failures that the man has experienced over the past twenty years, and just watch. You know, tomorrow it will be out for a day. By the time you're listening to this, what? Uh, uh, DJT, how that stock is doing. And I wouldn't be surprised if it actually has a little bit of a bubble. It is all, it's it's a speculative Ponzi scheme. It is the people who are buying his NFTs. It is a meme stock. It is in the long run going to be a penny stock. So it'll just be interesting. And sadly, sadly, there are two groups of people that are going to invest in this, right? There are the wealthy, cynical people who either on the one hand say, I want something from Donald Trump, I back off at TikTok and ByteDance, or the other wealthy people who look at all the not wealthy Trump supporters and say, those people are going to go out and buy a stock, just like you can go buy uh, one you know, stock share for the Green Bay Packers. They're going to go out and buy one stock of DJT just because. And I, cynically, am going to profit off all these people, the pensioners, the people living month to month on their Social Security checks who can't afford it. I'm going to profit take off of those people because I know those are the people that Donald Trump is going to sucker like he has been for his legal bills and everything else. I'm going to further profit take off of them. And that is the horrible reality of the little ecosystem that surrounds everything Trump financial. And it is miserable and it makes me so angry. Uh, But that's my final rant. Yeah. Or they'll they'll bet on the don't pass bar. Right. They'll they'll short it. Um. So we'll, we'll we'll keep an eye on that stock ticker, but we'll be back this weekend in your ears. I'll be in Columbus, by the way, um, recording the bonus episode for Cleanup in Columbus, March 29th, sold out show, so you can't come, but I'm looking forward to seeing everybody who got tickets. We'll see you then. And thank you again, all of our patrons. Thanks for listening. I've been Allison Gill. And I'm Pete Struck. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is written, researched, and produced by Allison Gill with editing by Molly Hockey. Our art and logo designer by Joelle Reeder and Moxie Design Studios, and our music is composed and performed by Adam Orr. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media.